Take your Bibles out, please, and open them up to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Seems like we were in John chapter 9 for, I don't know, what, 10 or 20 years, something like that? John chapter 10. So beneath the city of Rome to this day lie the famous catacombs. And they were used way back in the day just to get away from the summer heat. Just a place to get underneath the ground where it was cool. As well as for burial chambers, as you may have heard. There's a famous lady, Gala Placidia. And she was the sister of one of the early day Byzantine emperors. And on one of the walls in her burial chamber, down in one of those catacombs beneath Rome, is this mosaic right there on the screen. And so hopefully you can see it well enough to see that that is Christ the Good Shepherd. And he is seated on a rock. He is holding a shepherd's staff in the form of a cross. Uh, Sheep are all gathered around him. He strokes the head of one, one sheep. The other sheep look on. In the background you might be able to see waters just burst forth from a rock just in the midst of what is a lush garden. And I've never seen that. I would love to see that someday, but I've read about people who have been right down there underneath Rome in that catacomb and looked at that mosaic, which is right there. And they really say that no one who sees that ancient mosaic misses the thought that Christ followers will never lack any good thing. It's almost as if the artist, whoever it was in the ancient day, seems to have been saying of the Lord Jesus Christ from the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. And really the image of the Lord as shepherd of his sheep. That is an image that is found from cover to cover in both testaments of the Bible. The psalmist, for instance, wrote, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Isaiah declared, he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. Isn't that beautiful? Mark wrote that Jesus had pity on the crowds because, and I quote, they were like sheep without a shepherd. The author of Hebrews spoke of Jesus as the great shepherd. And so from that very rich mind of biblical imagery flows the famous parable of the good shepherd, which begins right here in the 10th chapter of John's gospel. Verse 1, and Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, and by the way, he is still speaking to the religious leaders, the Pharisees, from chapter 9. He who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own He goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So we today, we are separated by thousands of miles and years from the sheep and shepherds of the ancient Near East. Few of us really to this day have any first-hand experience with farm animals, any farm animals, including sheep. So really Jesus' analogy doesn't really resonate as deeply with us as it did with the men and women of his day. However, I think with some historical, with some cultural background, we can learn a whole lot about this symbol that Jesus used to describe himself. So shepherds in first century Israel... They were not looked down on as dirty, low-class laborers like you might have heard in church. What a terrible fallacy. That fallacy that shepherds were just dirty, despised workers, uh, that is a fallacy. It entered the church based on how shepherds were viewed very recently in the Middle East. They weren't viewed like that at all. In fact, shepherding in ancient Israel was a very respectable occupation. And my goodness, all you got to do is look at the Bible and how shepherding receives incredibly positive treatment all through the scripture. So shepherds in Israel tended sheep for their wool. It was for their wool. They didn't raise sheep for their their meat. 
The animals would graze and they'd grow these thick mats of fleece which could be sheared off and then sold for significant sums of money. So naturally, the larger a shepherd's flock, the greater his income. So the loss of just one sheep, well, it would cost him not only several pounds of fleece each season, but also the ability to just make more sheep and grow his herd. And so therefore, the shepherd faithfully nurtured and protected each animal, often for decades, owned them for decades. And he would sacrifice his own comfort to provide just safe grazing during the day. He would risk his own safety to guard the flock against thieves and predators during the darkness of the night. And so consequently, it was not uncommon at all for a shepherd to know each and every one of his animals individually, to call each one of them by name. In fact, I even read, I should have written it down, just some of the wonderful names from the ancient day that shepherds had for individual sheep. It was kind of a neat thing. A lot of them were called Todd, called Todd I think. A good shepherd in the ancient day never allowed his flock to remain in the field at night. Uh, because thieves and wild animals could take advantage of the darkness to steal and to kill. And, and it's interesting, if the pasture was close by a village or a town, then, then all the shepherds would lead their sheep from the fields to this communal pen, just the sheepfold, and it was guarded by a keeper in every single town. And then in the morning, shepherds would lead their sheep out to the pasture again. But during the mild weather months, just spring, summer, fall, shepherds would just frequently lead their sheep way out into the wilderness because they could just find ample grazing, green pastures. And, and the shepherds always remained with their sheep. They'd just camp out under the stars for weeks at a time. And then each night as darkness fell, they would, they would corral the flock into a cave or just some kind of a natural enclosure there and just sleep kind of at the entrance, really just made themselves, as it were, a living door. Shepherds out there in the wilderness would often work together and they would even share the same cave or enclosure during the night. Now the following morning would arrive and those shepherds, could, they, could, they could separate their flocks just simply by calling them in opposite directions. I like this, I was reading an old account. Way back in 1934, a preacher from here in America was traveling through Israel and he watched that firsthand. I'll just quote. He said, early one morning, I saw an extraordinary sight not far from Bethlehem. Two shepherds had evidently spent the night with their flocks in a cave. The sheep were all mixed together and the time had come for the shepherds to go in different directions. One of the shepherds stood some distance from the sheep and began to call. First one. Then another, then four or five animals ran towards him, and so on until he had counted his whole flock. So as we come to John chapter 10, Jesus just picked up on this very familiar scene from ancient Israel. He drew on all of that rich, figurative language of shepherds and sheep all through the Old Testament. He grabbed hold of God's warnings to Israel's unfaithful religious leaders, the Pharisees in Jesus' day, God's warnings to the religious leaders of the Old Testament even. That he would come to do the job of shepherding his people since you're doing a terrible job. And so Jesus drew, Jesus drew on all of that and he claimed to be the fulfillment of all of those long-standing promises. Because as you come to the time of Jesus, Israel's shepherds had really fleeced the sheep instead of feeding them. And so Jesus comes in as the good shepherd. And so chapter 10 really just continues the theme of chapter 9. Israel's religious leaders, the Pharisees of chapter 9, they should have protected God's sheep. Oh, but they proved that they are false shepherds. Do you remember? They actually excommunicated the blind man. One of the sheep they should have protected, they excommunicated, kicked him out. That's what they did, that blind man that Jesus healed. And, and then here we see in chapter 10 as we turn the page, the good shepherd leads this very sheep out of that barren wilderness of Judaism where he should have been taken care of, but he leads them out of that dead religion out into the green pastures of what we call today Christianity. So in chapter 10, Jesus clearly portrays the Pharisees as thieves and robbers. That's, that's who he's talking about. The sheepfold obviously represents Judaism, just the Jewish religion in which some of God's elect sheep were living when Jesus came. And Jesus, obviously, is the good shepherd. And he came in order to call out from the sheepfold of Ju Judaism those sheep whom God had given to him from all eternity past. And later, as we keep reading, Jesus is going to say that he will soon call out sheep from other folds 
so that there will be one big, great, beautiful flock called the church and one shepherd over that flock. And so finally, the gatekeeper was God or God's Holy Spirit who releases the sheep to Christ's call. So with that understanding of the parable of the shepherd, the sheep, the gatekeepers, the thieves, I think we can now turn our attention to well, what, is, what it teaches spiritually. What are the lessons, in other words, of this parable? First, the parable teaches that the Lord Jesus knows his sheep. That truth is implied right there in verse 3. He calls his own sheep by name. It's stated really more explicitly down in verse 14 where he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and they know me. By verse 15 we read that the shepherd will die for his sheep but not for all sheep. I just want a wonderful collection of truths just already. And just number one, God gave a certain number of people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus knows exactly who they are. They're his. He knows them by name and he died for them in order that he might lead them safely all the way to heaven. I mean, have you ever, ever thought about it? I mean, has it ever hit you that all of that was done even though God knew that some of his chosen sheep, no, all of his chosen sheep are sinners and don't deserve any of it. I just, it really hits me that Jesus knows us. And let that settle in. You know yourself. I don't mean the cleaned up you and me that are sitting here today trying to act all holy and churchy. I mean who we really are at our work. Jesus knows us, knows who we really are, the way we really are. And then here's the amazing thing. And yet, he died for us. I love how Paul, the apostle, magnified that wonderful truth in the book of Romans. For instance, in Romans 5 where he says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. God shows his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Do you get that? While we were sinners, Christ died for us. It's an old time bishop who wrote of that. Nothing in his flock is hidden from him. Their weaknesses, their failures, their temptations, their sins, the good which they have neglected when it was within reach, the evil which they have pursued when it lay afar. All is open before his eyes. He knew them and he loves them still. Isn't that beautiful? That brings us to the second lesson from the parable. Having known his sheep, Jesus calls his sheep by name. He said this really of the shepherd almost verbatim in verse 3. He calls his own sheep by name. And I want you to notice carefully the qualification that Jesus put there. It is not he calls the sheep by name, but he calls his own sheep by name. That is the doctrine of election, which is taught prominently in John's gospel. His own sheep. Well, those are the very people whom God gave to Jesus from eternity past. And when Jesus calls his own sheep by name, what are they going to do? They are going to come. They will come. In fact, remember when Jesus said back in chapter 6 of John, he said, all that the Father give me will come to me. So these sheep that we're reading about here then, they were the people living in Israel whom God had elected to save from eternal hell way back in eternity past. So Christ's whole earthly ministry, that's what we're looking at here in John. Those three years that Jesus ministered publicly in Israel. The whole ministry was never directed to the nation of Israel at large. In fact, Jesus said to the nation of Israel at large, later in this very parable, we'll come to it in verse 26, when he says, you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. So the sheep whom, whom Jesus called during his earthly ministry, they were the Jews that God had elected to save. These are the sheep that Jesus called by name and led out of Judaism. And I love it. The four Gospels are loaded with illustrations of the Good Shepherd calling out his own by name. I love it when we read about that Jesus just walking along one day in the book of Matthew. Well, I quote Matthew 9.9. 9, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose 
and followed him. Well, here is one, just one lone sheep of Christ. And what happened? The shepherd called him. Matthew recognized his voice and promptly just left it all, got up, just followed him. On another occasion, Jesus looked up and he noticed, we little Zacchaeus, you know the song, we little Zacchaeus, and, and you tell me, church, where was little, why did Jesus have to look up, where was Zacchaeus? He's up in a tree, right? And Jesus said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So again, here is one of the sheep that Jesus called by name. And, and, and the response was prompt, for we were told in the very next verse, so he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. We read of Philip in John 1. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and he said to him, follow me. Well, that right there shows us the shepherd seeking his sheep before he calls them by name. John 11 gives us an even more striking example of the drawing power of the shepherd's voice when he calls one of his own sheep. And there we read of Lazarus. Now, what's, what, why is Lazarus famous? Do what, what, you remember? Was it his life or his... Yeah, he's, he comes to him in John 11. Lazarus is dead, already in the grave. But when Christ called his sheep by name... Well, here it is, John eleven forty three. 43. Lazarus, come out. I mean, the sheep immediately responded. Well, what did Lazarus do? came out alive. A very touching example of the sheep knowing the shepherd's voice is found in John chapter 20. Remember this one, Mary Magdalene, she visited Jesus' tomb in the early morning hour, found that massive stone rolled away, and my goodness, the body of the Lord Jesus is gone, and, and she's distraught, and she's weeping. Well, suddenly she sees the Lord Jesus standing right there by her, but she doesn't know that it's him yet. He actually spoke to her. She just thinks, well, maybe he's the gardener or something like that. But it's, it's curious. A moment later, she recognized Jesus. And she says, Rabboni, which means teacher. Well, I ask you, what happened? What happened during that little interval? What enabled Mary to identify Jesus? Well, it was this. Just one word. From him, John 20, 16. Mary. Isn't that great? The moment that he called his sheep by name, she knew his voice. She knew it. And I just want to tell you, church, this is the way it has always been with God's elect all down through the ages. It is how he calls his people today. It is how he calls you personally. By your name. And that means that, that the sheepfold of this whole world is full of sheep. But the shepherd only calls his own sheep. You know, shepherds back in the ancient Near East, they would, they would stand at different spots in the morning around the sheepfold. The sheepfold and and they, they each had their own little peculiar call. It was kind of interesting. Many, many sheep all mixed in. Each shepherd would call with their own peculiar call. And their own sheep responded and gathered around their shepherd. But the good shepherd here, we see, goes a little bit further than that. Because he does more than just have his own peculiar call. He calls them by name. By, by name every time. And that means that these sheep belonged to Jesus even before he called them out of the sheepfold. And again, Jesus is just teaching the doctrine of election so clearly here. He says to the Jewish religi religious leaders later in verse 26, you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. He already taught the doctrine of election back in chapter 6, I remind you, where he says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Jesus came to call out his own sheep by name. God shows them in eternity past, gave them to Jesus, and, and they come to him one by one. When they hear him call them by name. 
Now, there are many people who do not like the doctrine of election today, but the Bible teaches it. In fact, election is the central point of this entire parable. God gave some sheep to Jesus, and he came to the door of the sheepfold, and, and knowing his sheep in advance, called to them by name and led them out. I mean, what a reminder that not all people are saved. Jesus didn't call the very Pharisees that he's telling this parable to. Jesus didn't call many of the Jews who were around him during that day. But all those are saved whom God gave to Jesus. And they will never be taken away from him, as we'll see in verse 28 soon. It's interesting, I've noticed that people who don't like this Bible doctrine, they often portray it in very cold, mechanical impersonal, arbitrary kind of a ways. But you think about it, it is actually to me a very tender, personal thing. For Jesus says that the shepherd calls his own sheep by name. And again, being called by name, personally by him, they, they follow him. They want to. And, and I'll admit it, you and I may never totally understand all of that, but I just know this personally. I find it amazing that God knows me and when I mean I, he knows my sin he knows the way I am and, and and yet in spite of all that knowing he chose to save to quote a wonderful lyric a wretch like me and not just that but to adopt me as his own son to send Jesus to call me my name out of this world lead me Keep me, take care of me, provide for me, protect me. Just into green pastures in this world and then ultimately all the way into the green pastures of heaven. I, I, what is there to fight against? Who would want to fight against that? Because if you admit that you are a sinner, which the Bible tells you that you are, if you agree with the Bible that it tells you that the only thing you deserve is condemnation and judgment in hell, which, by the way, that is all we, any of us deserve, my goodness, if you agree and admit to all of that, I just tell you, simply rejoice that a holy God chose you and sent the good shepherd to call you, to find you, and to call you out because you're his and to call you out by name. This brings us to the very important third lesson because the parable teaches us that having known his own sheep, having called them, the Lord Jesus leads them out. We read in verse 3, he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. So back to shepherds in the ancient Near East, they didn't drive their flock the way many sheep herders do today around the world. They, they, they didn't do that. They didn't use sheep dogs like German shepherds to nip at the sheep's heels and to drive them along. They didn't do that. Shepherds always walked at the head of their flock leading. Now, that's how they did it. They led them. And as the shepherds led, he would oft, often talk to his sheep in a sing-song voice. He could literally, I love these literal stories, uh, authentic stories from the ancient days. The shepherd could literally kind of lift his voice. He's leading the flock. So do you have that? They're out in the wilderness with all the things at the wilderness and all the potential dangers and pitfalls that could hurt or kill a sheep. And, and the shepherd could literally lift his voice into kind of a shrill, kind of a whinny, kind of a whinny thing. And, and, and he would call one or two of them. He'd notice them over there. Oh, they're getting too close to that cliff or they're getting too close to that ravine or whatever. And, and he would do that little whinny, kind of a shrill voice that was very unique to him. And, and remember, he, he knew them by name. I mean, he's like calling them out. And, and observers said those sheep would literally, well, they'd hear that, that real high, blah, 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 you know, and they'd lift their head and turn, you know, turn immediately. And they would hear his voice and see him leading the flock, and, the, and they would just return and follow. Oh, we, we need to get back in line. There's our shepherd. And, and he would, then he would just lead his flock over hill and dale to the green pastures where they would just eat all day long. It just, it's this wonderfully close and loving relationship between the shepherd and the sheep. And so let me just ask you, to, to what does Jesus lead his sheep, the ones that he calls by name? To what does he lead them? Into his own flock, what we call now the church, and into the green pastures where he loves them, and takes care of them, provides for them. 
From what? From what? Does Jesus lead them? So we know to what? It's into his flock, the church, into the green pastures and all the way home to heaven. But from what does Jesus lead them? Well, the answer is from anything that would keep them from his pasture. From anything. We've already seen one example in this story back in chapter 9. Jesus led the man who was born blind out of Judaism. Out from the thieves and robbers who were pretending to be shepherds, but they weren't shepherds at all. He led him out of that danger into the true flock, into the true green pastures. But there are so many other examples. Later, we're going to keep reading, obviously, in chapter 10. Later, Jesus is going to speak of other sheep that that are from other folds. And and he's going to state his intention to lead those sheep out out of what are called lesser allegiances. Now, that's interesting. Out of lesser allegiances. And lesser allegiances can be many things. You think about the history of the church. Jesus has led sheep from other countries and cultures out of paganism. Out of paganism. Jesus has led sheep here in America out of materialism. We actually are a materialistic society. We are an economically rich country where people can work and make money and we can blow money and we can fall in love with the wrong things and all that. Jesus has led people out of the lesser allegiance to just money, the almighty dollar, and worshiping it. He he has led others here in America out of just what we would call today progressive wokeism, political activism, just getting way too ate up with political activism and politics and all those things. Jesus has led others just out of the worship of knowledge. I just want to know more. I just want to know more so that I can be on the king of the hill, you know. He has led other people just out of the rat race of American life, just generated by our very competitive society. He has led still others just out of sexual identity issues that are just characterized by the the ubiquitous LGBTQ acronym. These and many more are our sheepfolds, whatever they may be. And it is from these, it is out of these, that Jesus Christ calls us. And, And perhaps he is calling you this very morning from some lesser allegiance. Even if you know you actually belong to his flock. But have you noticed, oh, you can just go, oh, I like that old sheepfold. I like that old shepherd better. I'm tired of this Jesus. I just just don't want to hear his voice anymore. Uh, I'm going to go back. I like that stuff better. You know, is Jesus calling you out from these lesser allegiances? And, And it's right here is our fourth and final lesson. Hearing his voice, Jesus' sheep always follow him. Follow him. Will you follow Jesus? We read in verse 4, He goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Why did the sheep in the ancient world follow their shepherd? Because they know him, right? They know his voice. We've seen that. They know his heart even. They know that he's always with them. Always. The The sheep are never on their own in those days. The shepherd provides, he protects. Just read about young David sometimes, back before he was a mighty king, even before he was a mighty victorious general, just when he's a shepherd. Just read about the the provision, the protection, and all those things. In short, sheep follow their shepherd because he's faithful to them. He's true, and they know that. And by the same token, we've seen that that the sheep run from anyone else because as Jesus said in verse 5, they do not know the voice of strangers. And Jesus' sheep, well, they follow him for the the exact same reason. He's true. He's true. And really, that's why Jesus' primary point in this parable has to do with the role of truth in this world. Truth. It's interesting that Jesus almost never presented truth in order to turn unbelievers into believers. Seems like he would have done that, but he didn't. In other words, he didn't engage in what we call today apologetics as a tactic for persuasion. You never really find Jesus arguing that, well, my truth is better than that guy's truth, you know, uh, and, and my truth is better than their truth. He never really does that. What Jesus did was use truth as the means to draw believers out of this world. He already knows them. He already knows they're his. The Father elected to save them. The Father gave them to Jesus in eternity past. He came to seek and to save them, to find them, to call them out by names, like Todd, Come out, come out. That's how Jesus uses truth. It's as a means to draw believers out of the world. And what I mean is that he just merely taught the unvarnished truth about his identity. 
who he is. He just said it. We've already seen it in John's gospel when he just said, I am. And to any Jew of that day, what did that, what, what was it, what was he saying? What was he saying of himself? I am who? I am God in the flesh. Oh, the beautiful I am statements all through this gospel where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. In other words, Jesus said it in a million different ways. I am God in the flesh. And guess what the false shepherds did to him? Oh, wow, they, they strung him up on the cross and killed him. Killed him for saying that. But what happened as Jesus just says, I am. What happened in response to that unvarnished truth of Jesus' identity? What was happening all through Israel during those three years? The flock that were in the sheepfold of this world, guess what happened? They began to divide. For the first time in human history, humanity began to divide. As Jesus just used the truth of who he is to draw out the believers to himself. In other words, genuine believers followed the voice of their master, while those who were not his own didn't. Truth always divides. And so the story ends by telling us that, that Jesus' opponents, verse 6, did not understand what he was saying to them. Well, how could they? They weren't of his sheep. They didn't belong to him. How could they? But you have no reason not to understand. If you are hearing Christ's call, you should respond to him immediately. And, and just immediately. To, to hear Christ's call. I want to be very clear on this. What do you mean, Pastor, to hear his call? To hear his call. I'm not, it is not the same thing of responding to emotional pressure. Like at some, you know, like at a Falls Creek youth camp or something. We have so overblown emotionalism. That's, that's not to hear Christ call, just to get caught up in emotions. I mean, my goodness, I know we've got fellow sports. I know I have fellow sports fans right here. I mean, raise your hand if you've ever felt emotionally excited at a football game, at a basketball game. I have, you know. The, would we ever confuse that with evangelism, with getting saved? Yes, the churches do that, you know. That's not to hear Christ's voice. Hearing Christ's voice is not the same thing as agreeing to become a member of a church. Now, should Jesus' sheep join the local flock? Yes, the New Testament teaches that. But you just tell me, if we looked at the church role of this church, any old church, I mean, do we find people who don't belong? Yes, we do. Hearing the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ is not the same thing as just coming down here and we vote on you and write your name somewhere. It's not agreeing to do anything, to do anything. It is hearing, hearing Christ deep within your own spirit. Above all, it is arriving at the conviction that what the Bible says regarding your need and what the Bible says regarding the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and answering that need, that that's true and that you have to respond to it. And wild horses can't hold you back. You, you hear it and you know it and you know he is the truth and you just have to follow him. And, and I just ask you, have you been sensing that? Have you been saying, yes, preacher, I, I know that what I'm hearing is true. And I've kind of been waiting for this all my life. This, this, is, this is it. This is what I've been waiting for. And, and, and if that resonates with you, I just want to say, do not make the mistake of being slow to answer Christ's call. Respond immediately, just like Zacchaeus. He was in the tree. What did he do? As soon as Jesus says, Zacchaeus, come down. What did he do? Well, I don't really know who you are. I mean, you know, I've heard some things about you. I'm kind of a short fellow. That's why I climbed up here to see you. I'm curious, Jesus. I'm a seeker. But, you know, but I'm also in Judaism. And, you know, no, what did he do? He hustled his little buns right down on the ground, went home and prepared a meal. You know, it's just like he heard Jesus. He responded immediately. Do that. We're talking about the great shepherd here and those who follow him will never want for any good thing anything you really need and ultimately all the way home to the safe green pastures of heaven would you please stand to your feet and bow your heads and close your eyes and heavenly father we just praise you for loving we stupid rebellious sheep so much 
so that in eternity past, for reasons that we will never understand, you, a holy God, just reached down when you should have ignored us and left us alone and just allowed the justice of redemption to happen and we should be cast into eternal hell for our own sins. We can't blame it on anybody else. And while that's what should have happened, Lord, that is not what happened for all of us. For whatever reason, God, you chose to, to just place your saving love on some of us wayward sheep and to give us to the Lord Jesus. And he walked right up to the sheepfold of this world and called us who were already his by name. And we just want to thank you, God, for giving us the spiritual life to just follow our shepherd. And Lord, we just want to follow you. We recognize today some of us have just fallen back into the sheepfolds of this world, into lesser allegiances. Oh God, would you just give us the courage and the boldness to just follow Jesus again. To follow him, just to keep. We're, we hear his voice. We're near danger perhaps. There are some of us who have fallen in love with the wrong people, the wrong things, and the wrong ideas. and Whatever that might be, Lord God, these lesser allegiances. God, call us out from that as a church. But ultimately we pray, Lord, if there is a sheep here that is yours, call them by name this morning that they will just follow the Lord Jesus in salvation. Save them, God. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.